Can I tell you that Holy Spirit is not just a, a person to be studied, but he is a person of the Godhead who we have relationship with. We don't just sing about him and go about our daily business. We worship God and we embrace his presence. And I don't know about you, but I rely on his spirit every day of my life. I don't just put words over a door for the sake of putting words over a door to put art on the wall. But when you walked into the, 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 uh, the auditorium this morning, like so many other mornings for the last, I don't know, five or six years, you walked underneath words that said something along the lines of the atmosphere of expectancy is the breeding ground for miracles. Because I expect not just to come to church and sing about an absentee God, but I come to church to sing to a present God who is present by Holy Spirit. And I want to make sure that everyone in the room this morning knows that Holy Spirit is here today. That he is empowering lives today. That he didn't cease his work once the early church was begun, but he is still empowering lives today. It's what, 10, 1130? Across our country right about now, there are multiple churches who are worshiping a living, present God. This moment right now, just down the road at Lakeshore Camp, there are a bunch of junior highs who are seeking the present and not only seeking, but encountering the presence of Holy Spirit. He's not just something to be studied. He's someone to be honored and cherished to be sought after and longed for. So let's open off this morning our our word, our our time of, uh, of preaching. I know it's a time of studying, but let's open it off by welcoming him here this morning. Lord, we thank you for your presence. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here today. Would you, Holy Spirit, guide us through this message time. Guide us through our, our time in your word. Teach us today. Mold us today. Help us today. Father, I pray that you would anoint my lips this morning to preach your word. God, I pray that you would anoint our ears, mine included. Lord, anoint our ears that we might hear your word. God, anoint our minds that we might understand a little more your word. And anoint our hearts to receive it, be transformed by it, and apply your word to our everyday life. God, we thank you for your presence. God, we thank you that we are even able to stand and worship you today. For you are great, Lord. Your presence is overwhelming. It's life-giving. It's refreshing. Thank you, Jesus, for your love for us. Would you guide us through this message? In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Anoka, thank you for, where did you go? Getting a coffee. I see, I see. Anoka, thank you for leading us in worship again this morning. For many, summertime is an opportunity for them to go away and to be refreshed. And for others, it's a time of stretching and growing. So Anoka, I'm so grateful that you are willing to be stretched and grow in the anointing that God has placed on you. The word of encouragement that you brought to the church about ever being in a place where you feel like you are, uh, you're not equipped or, or you're not supposed to be there. Can I tell you, my friend, you are anointed and gifted, and the place in which you are in is where God has placed you. Thrive in it. Today we conclude our three-part uh, series on Made New. Anybody ever wake up in the morning and wish your body was made new? This morning as I got out of bed, I was just like, oh my goodness, is it really daytime already? Every creak and crack and ache, I was like, oh, I feel like I am 
the age that I am. But I'm so grateful that God is in the business of making all things new. And we started off this, this series on being made new in God with the desire to be different. And that God has placed within each and every one of us this desire for eternity. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. This, this hunger, this longing for what is eternal. And what is eternal is God himself. We have a desire to be different, which led us last week to the drive to be different. Christina this morning, was, uh, we were on our drive here this morning, she was looking at the, the message online, and she realized the title of, of the message last week, The Drive to be Different, and she chuckled. She's like, was that on purpose? No, it wasn't. She wasn't here last week because she was still suffering from the, uh, the side effects of the poisoning that went into her system that she was hospitalized for, but gratefully, she was released last Saturday, that she is doing better, that this morning, she was able to be on the platform again. I don't know if you noticed it or not, but during handshake time, I didn't shake your hand. I'm not sorry. Forgive me. But I came over to check on my wife because she's still not 100%. Was she ever 100% in my eyes? Yes, but uh, as she was sitting up there during handshake time, she said that her head was pounding again, that she was foggy again, that she felt like she was going to throw up, that she just needed to go lie down. And I just began to pray in my spirit that Holy Spirit would strengthen her to carry her through the time of ministry. I didn't title last week's message, The Drive to Be Different, because it was a drive that poisoned her at all, but the drive, the desire, the, the hey, I'm going to see this thing through, the, to keep going on this journey of sanctification, on this transformation that I am in, the drive to be different. Today, we conclude it with another D, the discipline to be different. Because in order to be made new and to stay in this process of being made new, there has to be some discipline to be different. Now, what comes to mind when someone uses the word discipline? Often what comes to mind when discipline is, is mentioned is punishment. I remember hearing stories of my grandfather and how he would punish my dad and his brothers and my aunt as, as they were be driving. And I remember the story so clearly as my dad sat in the back seat of their car with his brother and their feet had gotten wet in the pond and they were stinking in their shoes and they took their shoes and their socks off and they kind of stuck them up in the air right beside Pop's head as he was driving. I can picture it now, the anger boiling up in my grandfather. He was a mighty man of God who was transformed by the presence of God in an instant cured and, and, and every chain of addiction broken off. He served God with his whole heart. But I can imagine that veteran's anger dwelling and building up as these little stinky feet were beside his head. And the story goes that he pulled the car over to the side of the road. He said, that's it, get out. And he made them get out of the car, go find yourself the switch. They had to go pick which stick he was going to punish them with. I'm, I think my dad told me that story to sort of put a little bit of fear in my heart. I had never had to have a switch or a wooden spoon that I can recall. Just the simple raise of my dad's voice probably invoked images of that moment that he had told me. And it was enough. But when discipline is spoken... Often it's punishment. And if I say in this sermon, the sermon is titled Discipline to be Different, quite often what's going to come to your mind is a passage maybe like Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24. He who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is careful to discipline him. But that's not necessarily the passage I'm going to go with today. There's got to be more to discipline than a switch. There's got to be more to discipline than a wooden spoon. Because the message is not titled, Beaten to be Different. It's Discipline to be Different. See, right discipline, correct discipline, loving discipline, focuses on the now and the future, uses the past to change the now and the future in a positive way. And it comes out of a heart of love with this desire to train, to mentor, to make better, to raise, to make new. 
corrupt or negative discipline focuses on the punishment only side over the past failures out of a desire to pay back, to abuse, to torture with little regard to making the future any more positive. When it comes to sin, the Lord's discipline is not so much about the consequence. It's not so much about consequence. No, no, no. The Lord's discipline is in spite of sin. For the believer, for the Christian, our discipline, the Lord's discipline in our lives is not a consequence to our sin. No, no, it's in spite of our sin because he desires for you to be better. Our main text for today, you can bookmark it so we can keep flipping back, is in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4. Verses 4 through 13. When you got Hebrews 12, verse 4, say, I got it. Wow, you would have all lost a sword drill growing up. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12, are you there? I'm not putting the entirety of the message that, that up there. You there? The title that you will likely see in your Bible above Hebrews chapter 12 is God's discipline. So God disciplines his children or, or something of that sort. This, remember, was not written as a book. This, what you're reading, is a letter. It was a letter when it was originally written without the chapters and the verses to break it up. But one letter with a flow. So the, the preceding texts that lead into what we're going to read about today, the preceding text in this letter was about faith. We know it as the, the chapter on faith. It's the heroes of faith. See, what's happening here is the writer is writing this letter, and he's writing it in a way that builds up the reader as he describes great people of faith who, because of their faith and favor with God, saw incredible things take place in and through their lives. As he writes from that list, that incredible list of heroes of the faith in chapter 11, he opens up chapter 12, but re remove that for a moment. It's not opening up another chapter. It's one letter. It's one flow. So he builds up the reader in talking about these great men of faith. And then he moves right along from that right into verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, therefore, since we, say we, are surrounded, say surrounded, keep that in mind. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out ahead of us. You are surrounded. As a believer, as a Christian, as someone who has given their life to Christ and intentionally follows him in their every day, can I tell you, you are surrounded with these great faith warriors. He's writing this letter to, to, to these people and he's using these words, since we are surrounded. Now, put yourself in an army war situation. If, you are, if we describe something as you are surrounded by an army, the, 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 the reality could be only one of two things. You are either surrounded by the army because you are about to be taken captive, but that's not the case here, or you're surrounded by the army. You're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. Because the one who's speaking it is saying, hey, I consider you to be one of them. You are surrounded because you are part of the family. You're part of the faith. Can I tell you that you, as a believer, that you have the ability, that you have the calling to be a great warrior in faith? What made them great in faith was this. It was their proximity to God. Can I remind you that God wants to be near you? 
He wants you to be near him. He wants to be in proximity to your everyday life. When I was in student ministries for a lot of years, there was a time in our ministry in Lindsay where where there were so many kids from so many different types of homes, but you can always pick out what kind of home they came from from just observing their behavior. Now, the students who came from homes that, well, their parents were strict. Their parents were, 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 were disciplined. And they, they were well-disciplined homes. Those who came from the strict, disciplined parents who did it out of love, not the strict, disciplined parents who were just tyrants, but the strict parents who did it out of love, those were the, the parents that so many other students who had absentee parents longed to have. It was heartbreaking so often to watch these kids who come from homes whose parents are there, but they're never really there. Ones who would, who would you know, their, 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 their chore was to go down and get their parents their fix because they were too out of their mind to go get their fix themselves. They'd come to youth, and they would look at the families, and they would look at these kids who were being, you know, you know, grounded because they stayed out too late, whereas this student had to go get a drug deal done for their parent. And they would look at those families, and they would have this conversation with me in their, my office about this desire, this longing, if they only had parents like their parents. Because, well... We all want to be better. We all want to be different. And we all deep down somewhere know and understand. Even the child who doesn't have parents to discipline know deep down inside that it takes healthy discipline to be different. Those students with the absentee parents, what they truly wanted was to be a part of a loving family that would help them grow. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you, say me. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you might declare, say declare. Declare? declare. declare. Not whisper? Declare. Not think? Not silently go, yeah, we're praising him right now. But you might what? Declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Can I tell you, church, you are are wanted. You are longed for. Romans 10, verse 9. If you confess, say confess, with your mouth. That means you have to open it and utter something. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that confession is a statement of absolute truth for the one in whom is saying it. So as young as you are stating for absolute truth, he is Lord. Now that Lord is not just a title, it is master, supreme authority. So I'm confessing that he, it is absolute truth for me, that Jesus Christ is my master, my ruler, my absolute authority, and whatever he says for me to do, I should do my best to try to accomplish that. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Confess and believe, and you will be saved. You will be born again. It speaks to the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus that you must be born again. Your spirit is born again by the life-giving aspect of the Spirit of God. You are born again, made new. Romans eight fourteen. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him, say by him, 
by the spirit of sonship, by him, the capital S spirit, by holy, we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we might also share in his glory. Where am I going with all of these verses? We are children of God that are led by the Spirit of God. John 16, verse 7. But I tell you the truth. It is, good. It is for your good. Say it's for my good. It's for your good that I am going away. This is Jesus talking to his disciples before he went away. Unless I go away, the counselor, your Bible might say the advocate, will not come to you. This word counselor or advocate is from a legal standpoint. It's like your lawyer will not come to you, your your wise counsel. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment in regard to sin because men do not believe in me, in regard to righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and in regard to judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. He is your counselor. Holy Spirit is your advocate. It's where we get the idea of a legal representative that is on your side. Say, he's on my side. Holy Spirit, our advocate, convicts us of sin. So a good lawyer, a good legal representative does not bring about judgment. No, 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 no. Holy Spirit doesn't bring about guilt to pronounce judgment. He comes to defend. So conviction brings us to a place where we can be changed. It brings us discipline to be different. Now, the discipline to be different, it might hurt in the process. How many enjoyed being disciplined in the flesh? It hurt. You don't enjoy those moments. It might hurt in the process, but the result, the result is becoming the one in whom we were originally created to be. And when you get through discipline and on the other side, it is almost refreshing. It's like having that sliver taken out. It hurts to have mom take out the needle and put it on the stove to make sure it's disinfected and it's blazing red hot. That part I think she did out of torture. But it hurts in the moment for her to dig that sliver out. But the moment it's out, it feels so much better and you can accomplish so much more. It might hurt in the moment of discipline. But the moment we endure it and learn from it, oh my goodness, we're better for it. See, this discipline to be different that hurts, it's kind of like a conviction to change, a reality of I need to change. And the reality is this. You and me both need to change. That there's no one in here today that is perfect. Not one of us have arrived. Now, some of you look like it. But reality is, no one here is perfect. That we are all on this process, this this journey with Jesus that brings about this ongoing transformation, this sanctification. We all need to recognize every time we encounter the presence of Holy Spirit, the things in our lives that need to change. Because he brings about conviction. It's not just about the goosebumps. It's not just about the warm fuzzies that us Pentecostals love to talk about when we go to camps and conventions and retreats. No, 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 no. When you authentically encounter the manifest presence of God, there comes about a conviction moment as well. Oh, there's all kinds of enjoyment and blessing and favor. Absolutely. But there is also something you cannot separate from an authentic encounter with God is a realization of who we are in comparison to who he is. See, Isaiah even had it. Isaiah, this prophet, in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord 
seated on the throne. By the way, subnote, sermon for another day. But in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. The thing that caused Uzziah to die was his pride. So every time I read this verse, I, I, I read it and I tell myself this over and over again. In the year that pride dies, I will be able to see the Lord. The moment pride begins to rise up in my life, I can no longer see him because all I see is myself. But Isaiah pens this. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. The train of his robe filling the temple? Oh, my goodness. When a king would conquer another kingdom, they would add that king's robe to the train of his robe, and the more kingdoms they would overtake, the longer the train of his robe would get. Can I tell you that he has conquered it all? That the train of his robe fills the temple. Above him were seraphims, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. With two, they were flying. And they were calling out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook. Can I tell you that their voices must have been loud? And the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I yell because it has an exclamation mark. you got to read it the way it's written. I cried, I am ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips. I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. We are already in the sixth chapter of Isaiah. So if you jump back to the first chapter of Isaiah, in verse 1, the vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, during the reigns of Uzziah. He sees these visions during the reigns of Uzziah. In Isaiah chapter 6, he says, in the year that King Uzziah died. So he had already been used of God before we get to chapter 6. During the reign of King Uzziah, Isaiah was used. Yet in 6, verse 5, after Uzziah had died, Isaiah feels conviction that he is a man of unclean lips, that he wasn't perfect, that he still needed redemption. In Luke chapter 5, verse 8, when Simon Peter saw this, it's that big catch of fish, more than just one salmon for an entire morning out. This huge, massive catch of fish that's about to sink the boat. When he sees this, Simon Peter says, it says he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, I am a sinful man. Peter encounters God. Isaiah encounters the presence of God. And both instances, when they encounter the presence of God, have a realization moment, a recognition moment, that they are in the presence of perfection, and they are not. You can't go to church because you'll catch on fire. Words I've heard from so many people who've never been to church. Uh, I can't go in there. I open that door and walk in. The place is going to burn down. Ever hear those words from someone? Ever you hear someone use an excuse like that? I can't, I can't go. I'll be struck by lightning. Welcome, Pastor Marcus. Good to have you this morning. Ever hear someone say something like that? Use an excuse like that? I can't go to church because that might happen? Can I tell you it's a fear of punishment coming from an inner conviction but yet not realizing that God's desire is not for punishment, but forgiveness to avoid the punishment. And that forgiveness brings about an opportunity for him to bring discipline to be different. See, when you encounter the presence of God, whether you're a prophet of old, whether you're a mature believer or a not yet Christian, the result of encountering the manifest presence of Holy Spirit brings about a conviction to change a desire to be different, that change can happen when you are a child of God because he brings discipline to his children. That brings us to our main text, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4. Are you there? In your struggle against sin, 
you have not resisted, not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son. Now insert your name there. Mark. Do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves. And he punishes everyone he accepts as son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while while they, as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline, say no discipline, seems pleasant at the time but fit painful. Later on, however, it produces, say it produces. That discipline, the Lord's discipline in your life will produce something. It produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Look first at verse 6. Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises everyone he accepts as son. Conviction, chastising, is a challenge to change, comes from a place of love. Feeling convicted? Embrace that. Feel, because he loves you. Being corrected, embrace that because he loves you. Are you feeling challenged to change your lifestyle? Embrace that because he loves you. Verse 9, how much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Say and live. God's discipline makes us new. God's discipline brings about change in our lives. It makes us new so that we can truly live the extraordinary, the extraordinary life that God has planned for each and every one of us to live. See, God has he made known to the angels the, the extraordinary plan that he has for you, and even the angels get excited over the extraordinary plan that God has for your life. When we are made new, it positions us to truly live that extraordinary life that we were created to live. This hope, this faith, it makes the chiseling moments worth every painful second. Because being chiseled out, having the bad taken out, is not always a pleasant feeling. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. It might hurt now, but the result of enduring the discipline of the Lord is being made new, is becoming the man or woman that God has desired for you to be all along. The chiseling of that process, that might hurt. Faith, could you play that second video for me before I give the benediction this morning? It's the second last slide. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's workmanship, his masterpiece. I don't know about you, 
But when I get up in the morning and look in the mirror, I don't really see a, a masterpiece, you know? I mean, maybe a Picasso. It's like, <laughs> but I want to be his masterpiece. I want to be everything he created me to be. And so I go to him in prayer and I say, dear heavenly father, do whatever it takes to mold me into the image of your son. Make me your masterpiece. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Hi. Whoa. Who are you? I'm God. You said the prayer, so here I am. You're not God. No, I am. You said the prayer. That's how it works. Okay, okay. If you're God, then uh, make it snow in here. You know what? I really don't want to make it snow in here because it'd get kind of yucky. Yeah, you're not God. Why do you say that? God wouldn't say yucky. I do. It's a Greek word. Oh. Okay, okay. Um, if you're God, what does Lamentations 15.9 say? Lamentations is only five chapters. It's a very short book. Oh. Why was it so short? I was tired of lamenting. Oh. Okay, okay. If you're God, who's going to win the World Series this year? I'm really not into playing games. Why are you so much into playing games? You are God. Well, gave it away. You answered my question with a question. I did? <sighs> yeah, I do that. Don't I? I did it again. <laughs> Step right up. Here we go. Okay. All right. Hey, what are we doing? I'm going to make you my original masterpiece. This is the process. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. Wait, wait. What are these about? These are the tools I'm going to use to make you into my original masterpiece. Okay. Yeah. Hang on. Yeah. I thought you were a carpenter. That's my son. Step right up. Here we go. Okay. Oh, hey, God. Mm -hmm. How do you know what to chisel away and what to leave? I take out everything in your life that doesn't belong there, kind of like dead weight. Ooh, speaking of dead weight, could you chisel right here? It showed up when I was in my 20s and grew around and became back fat. I don't even know why you created that, but I can't get rid of it. I mean, I've tried everything. Like, I tried running, I tried lifting weights. My wife actually talked me into trying Pilates. That was awkward. But I can't get rid of it. So if you would just chisel around here, and then, you know what, if you chisel a line right here and maybe... Four to five, maybe eight lines right here. That would be awesome. You're funny. You made me that way. I also made the platypus. Oh, the platypus? All I'm saying is most of my children, when it comes to this process, they just want to talk, but they don't want to do the work. So do you want to talk or can I chisel? Talk, chisel, No, talk, no, chisel. no, 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 no. I choose to chisel. All right. Through my Holy Spirit, I'm going to bring up things in your life that I want you to work on. Like your anger. I created the emotion, but you use it in the wrong way. Um, you compare yourself to others instead of me. You tell little white lies because you want to people please. You're lazy. But you try to fool everybody by looking really, really busy. You have a problem with lust? Well, time out. <laughs> I don't really have a problem with lust. You don't have a problem with lust. No, I can do it any time I want. <sighs> Hang on a second. I mean, I, I, I got to admit, I, I feel like you've been doing some great work, and I'm looking pretty good right now. All right, when you look in the mirror, who do you see? I see me. Okay, then I need to keep chiseling away because ultimately you and other people need to see my son. Okay, don't misunderstand me. It's just um, when I look more like Jesus, people get uncomfortable around me. I mean, even my church friends, and they're like, oh, you're holier than thou, you know? And, and I, don't, I don't think I'm supposed to make people uncomfortable. So what you're saying is you'd rather play God in certain areas of your life than for me to be God over your whole life. That is not what I said. It's what you meant. Yes, it is. Um... It's hard to talk to you. You know everything that I'm thinking. I'm just saying you've done some great work. Maybe we take a break, a sabbatical from each other, you know. I'll stay right here and then, you That's know. That's just it. You never just stay right there. You're either moving toward me or away from me, but never you just stay. What you're doing is called control. Do you want to control things or life or can I chisel? Control, chisel, control, no, chisel. No, chisel, chisel. All right. But can we chisel where I want? That's called control. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Now this right here, this secret sin that you keep running to whenever you're hurting, angry, lonely, tired, that you think you're fooling everybody, but it's making you a whitewashed tomb. Are you ready for me to chisel this out of your life? Yeah. You see, it's a process. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's your whole life. And you care so deeply about what other people think of you. It's rubbish. It's garbage. The greatest thing you're ever going to hear is at the end of your life when you hear me say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what you keep your eye on. That's the prize. Heavenward. <laughs> oh, that hurts. Oh, trust me. This hurts me more than it hurts you. Right. 
the chisel. Okay. I'm sorry. I just I don't think you understand this pain. Pardon? Process. You're asking me to sacrifice a lot, God. Can be painful. But can I tell you, it is being done by a more loving father than this world has ever seen. The conviction of Holy Spirit around the sins that need to be chiseled out is not to bring about this feeling of guilt, but this desire to change and recognition of our need to be different. And it's not just for us. Hebrews 12, 12 through 13. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. Make level paths for your feet. Not for you, but so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather be healed. We need, as a church, this summer, in our desire to be refreshed and then soak up all the rays and enjoy the sun and all the rest of it. In all of that, we need to embrace the discipline of the Lord to be different so that others can know him. Just like in the video, when you look in the mirror, who do you see? Me, great. You need to see, they need to see Jesus. So that takes us living And being willing to submit to the Lord's discipline. Don't take it, don't take it as punishment. Realize it as love. Why? So we can reflect Him. So we can, number one, make Him pleased. So we can be who He's originally created us to be. And so we can make straight level paths so that others can come and know him. So Lord Jesus, this summer, would you make us as a church brand new? Would you make us individually? Lord, would you make us new? Lord, would you help us to stay on this path, this narrow road that all along the way you keep chiseling out, making us who you created us to be, God, would you help us to embrace your discipline so we can change and not go back and not live in it and keep doing the I'm sorry. But Lord, help us to truly change. And help us, God, to be such a great witness for you. Not that we're perfect, but that we're striving to live for you. And through that, Lord, Let us see a harvest of souls. With everyone's eyes closed and no one looking around, this morning if you're here and you have not been living the life that God has called you to live, whether you've accepted him in the past and turned and walked away from him or you've never accepted him this morning, I'd be amiss if I did not give you the opportunity you always have the opportunity, whether you're in church, walking down the street, in your car, where you're alone, the opportunity is always there. But I would be amiss if I didn't give you the opportunity this morning, make it known that God loves you. And it doesn't matter the past that you've lived, he loves you. And his desire for you is not the punishment that the sin deserves, but his desire for you is the forgiveness that he's already paid for because he wants to have relationship with you. And he's a just God. He's a pure and perfect God. So we need to be forgiven so we can have that relationship. And he made that possible by his son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross, shedding his blood for you. So if you've never accepted him, never entered into that relationship with God, I quoted a verse, I used a verse earlier. It's a confession of Jesus Christ as Lord. It is simply saying, God, I believe in you. I trust in you. It's recognizing that, hey, I'm not perfect. I've messed up. God, would you forgive me? It's believing that Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose again. 
and it's wanting a relationship with him. If that's where your heart is at, would you tell him? Would you tell him? It's called prayer, talking to Jesus. I'm not going to lead you in the specific words because it's an intimate relationship, a conversation between you and God. So it's simply saying something along the lines, God, I love you. I believe in you. God, I'm a sinner. I've messed up. I'm not perfect. Whatever label you want to throw on it, I am not perfect. I need to be forgiven. And he will forgive you. God, I want to have a relationship with you. When you confess Jesus Christ as Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, oh my goodness, something amazing happens. You're adopted into the family. You're born again. Your spirit comes alive. Your name is written down in the Lamb's book of life. That's, that's, that's heaven's address book. <laughs> the residence of heaven. Because you become a part of the family. So if that's you this morning, can I encourage you? Make that decision. Make it again. But there's one other thing I'd like to challenge you to do. Tell someone about it. Tell someone that you came with this morning or someone else that's here, tell them about that decision because it's the most important, powerful decision you will ever make. Father, I thank you for your presence here. Holy Spirit, thank you that you are here right now, that you've been here through this service, that you've guided us through your word. Help us now take it and apply it to embrace your discipline, to hear your conviction, and to follow your path and your leading so we can be made new. Be with us as we go from this place today. And I ask that your favor would follow each and every person as they follow you. And Lord, as we gather together on Tuesday for outreach, God, I pray that you'd soften the hearts of those who will be there. Give us discernment, Lord, and help us to begin to plant seeds again this summer that would lead to a harvest of souls. As every sandwich is made on Thursday, God, Lord, would you bless those sandwiches to be used of you to be a message of love to those downtown Peterborough. As we gather again on Sunday, Lead us back here, Lord, with joyful hearts and a testimony in our hearts of what you have done in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Be blessed. Have a fabulous afternoon. Spend some time socializing and meeting with each other following the service, and we will see you guys Tuesday, Thursday, or Sunday.